It's a wonderful privilege to be here and to speak today about some of the work that's uh, being undertaken in my lab, but also uh, some, er some work that's being undertaken uh, at the Biomedicine Discovery Institute that I belong to at Monash University. Our uh, institute uh, consists of a number of different and um, similar departments, the, the standard department structure you might see in a, in a university, uh, but we also work across those departments uh, on general themes uh, related to biomedicine. So we start with basic science uh, for discovery. We go through translation, collaborations, connections, develop those approaches and, and work through how we engage with a wider community. The so I wanted to start with, with uh, the area that I work on, and that's in mitochondria. And mitochondria, this is a cell here, this is the nucleus in blue, and these blobs here are mitochondria. Uh, they've got a green outer membrane and a red in, uh, matrix, and mitochondria are the fuel of, of life uh, for eukaryotes. Uh, we have a, the, the sort of simple elements around mitochondria is that they are organelles in our bodies, in animals and plants, uh, in, in other eukaryotes, and they share a common ancestor with bacteria. So very similar structures inside mitochondria uh, belong in bacteria as well. But the mitochondria contains about 1,200 different proteins, uh, and most of them are actually encoded by the nuclear genes and the proteins go into mitochondria, but there's still remnant mitochondrial DNA uh, that codes in our bodies, in, uh, 13 proteins still uh, that uh, are needed by, by the mitochondria and that, that's kept in that mitochondrial DNA. Now, the main functions of mitochondria is in production of ATP, the, the universal currency of energy, uh, but they're involved in many other processes, involved in heat production, for example, uh, and also in signaling. Uh, so, for example, they're involved in calcium signaling, the generation of reactive oxygen species, uh, they're involved as platforms in innate immune processes, and they're also involved in the cell in undergoing cell death, program cell death, such that when cells get old uh, and need to be turned over, uh, there's a silent form of cell death uh, called apoptosis that, uh, that enables that cell to die uh, uh, in an immunologically silent uh, manner. But in some cases, this actually doesn't happen. And, and Kate, uh, who, I work, who works with me in the lab, uh, has started looking at the um, mitochondria in cells and asked what happens if the cells don't undergo that programmed cell death and it's slow, the, the, the basically the enzymes that would kill the cells uh, are blocked. And so what happens is you can see these threads of, of mitochondria in uh, red and these dots of green are the mitochondrial DNA. And what she actually found that if you delayed the cells to die, the uh, pores that are, uh, are normally opened, opening up mitochondria to turn, uh, to, to turn the, uh, cause the cells to die, actually get bigger and bigger. And eventually, uh, these dots of um, mitochondrial DNA start to escape outside of the mitochondria. So you probably can see it here, it's coming out now. And the mitochondrial DNA is actually now being exposed outside of the mitochondria and into the cell. And the cell now thinks that that mitochondrial DNA is actually foreign to it. It's never seen it before. It doesn't normally exist outside uh, the mitochondria. And that actually can turn on an immune response because it looks like bacterial of origin as well. Uh, so that's uh, a, a basic science event using some really sophisticated microscopy uh, and imaging approaches to identify a procedure that's now opened up a, a, a whole field of innate immune processes involved mitochondria and, and the disease programs that are there as well. Now, I'll just focus then now on the, the classic mitochondrial diseases, and these are the diseases that are actually are caused by mutations in the genes that encode mitochondrial proteins, whether they're the, the genes inside mitochondrial, of, of mitochondrial DNA or the RNA, um, or the proteins or the genes encoded by the nucleus that go into mitochondria. And m genetic mutations of those can cause mitochondrial disease. In this case, we actually have mitochondria that are going to have dysfunction, and we're not going to produce enough ATP. And that occurs in about 1 in 4,300 live births. Uh, and it causes a v wide variety of uh, defects in, in um, individuals because the, there are so many different mutations that can cause mitochondrial defects. But classic uh, elements are 
for example, muscle weakness, um, uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, because the muscles are not generating enough ATP from that mitochondria, and so th th there are defects there. But we also have a lot of neurological effects there, including Parkinson's uh, approaches, uh, ataxia, epilepsy, uh, neurodegeneration. And that uh, comes through also because the brain, even though it's 2% of weight, it uses 20% of that ATP that we, we, we're using of our body. So it's a huge uh, re requirement of mitochondria uh, in, in the brain. Now, we know now that the molecular basis of disease uh, from those genetic mutations occur uh, is, uh, we've understood them in about 60% of patients, but we're still trying to understand the basic effects of what some of these gene mutations are doing uh, to, to cause them the, the defects in mitochondria. But most of these uh, defects really come through from th affecting these machines in mitochondria. These are protein machines, really large machines uh, that sit in the inner membrane of mitochondria that actually drive the production of ATP. This is the oxidative phosphorylation machines or electron transport chain here that uh, takes electrons from uh, NADH, so uh, compounds that are uh, produced through uh, the, the utilization of carbon uh, that were in the foods we eat, and the electrons are stripped off NADH and driven through the complexes uh, through a, a series of events and uh, made mobile in a membrane and eventually passed all the way down through these complexes uh, before uh, oxygen is converted to water. Those processes of electron transport drives proton pumping across the membrane, and that proton gradient that's generated actually is then sucked back through this uh, enzyme, which is an enzyme complex that moves around uh, as, a, as a, uh, a, a really incredible rotor that generates ATP uh, for production. Now we are, and we had this really lovely um, dance before, we really talked around oxygen consumption. We're using about 380 litres of oxygen a day to actually drive the production of ATP. And in order to actually make all of this in our bodies, we, if we stripped out the inner membrane of mitochondria from our bodies and put it along the surface, it would be 14,000 square metres of membrane that actually is required to, to fill up these proteins to, to produce the ATP. And if we couldn't regenerate that ATP because we're using it all the time and turning it over, if we couldn't turn, uh, turn it over and we had to make it all the time, we would be actually making 65 kilos of ATP per day. So it's an incredibly important process that we have with the mitochondria, and we know now that the many different mutations affect these different processes. So we have um, identified over 290 disease-causing genes that are linked to oxidative phosphorylation processes, uh, numerous nuclear genes, uh, and most of the genes of mitochondria have mutations uh, that, that can cause uh, defects in this process as well. And about one in 200 of us actually contain disease-causing mutations. And there's some evidence that over time, in ageing, we accumulate more mitochondrial DNA mutations because this process generates more reactive oxygen species uh, and that can damage mitochondrial DNA in the long run. Now, we in the lab have been working on uh, understanding the functions of many of these genes, characterising the molecular basis of disease, uh, and under trying to understand these through classical biochemical approaches. But I, I won't go into any more detail there. But just to note that the therapeutic approaches to try and counteract mitochondrial disease is an extremely challenging uh, area, but it's something that we're taking basic science and working with clinicians to try and understand how we can work that. One uh, pr pretty exciting area, though, uh, is the potential of changing mitochondrial DNA in a therapeutic approach, uh, where we can actually prevent the maternal inheritance of mutations in my DNA. So this is uh, families who have a long history of mutations of mitochondrial DNA being passed along the maternal line, so the mother passes on to the children, and has a, has a, if it has a daughter, that daughter can pass the mitochondrial DNA mutations down the line, because only mitochondrial DNA is inherited from our mothers. Now, if, if there are mutations in mitochondrial DNA, sometimes the offspring, offspring of those um, individuals uh, uh, cause, uh, or, or have a very uh, debilitating um, mitochondrial disease. And so new approaches generated and pioneered by the group in Newcastle in the UK and now uh, being trialled in Australia through a, uh, the Mitre Hope program run through the Biomedical uh, Discovery Institute uh, is 
uh, looking at, at taking eggs from the, the mother, the infected mother, and taking the nucleus out of the egg and away from the defective mitochondria that has the mitochondria, defective mitochondrial DNA. But the genetic uh, blueprint uh, for, for, of, of the mother's is, is passed into a donor egg that has healthy mitochondrial DNA, and that donor egg has its, uh, the, the nucleus has been removed uh, previously. So this will then generate uh, new eggs that are now, uh, if implanted back into the mother, will generate offspring which will ha now have healthy mitochondria and will now be able to block uh, that future uh, transmission of, of defective mitochondrial DNA and, and uh, as a therapeutic approach to disease. So this is, involves uh, originally basic science, basic discoveries, now working uh, in a really large group under a clinical trial in, in involving clinicians, gen geneticists, biochemists, uh, IVF uh, specialists, and a, even a community foundation of the Mitochondrial Foundation as well, and also public health scientists involved in, in the clinical trial and advocates of this one. And particularly interesting, we, we, we also involved with bioethicists, so we're really bringing the big teams together. And it's a good example of showing how we can come together uh, from a basic institute uh, into something that's much bigger. So our, our institute uh, recognises the, the really importance of basic science, discovery science. Uh, we also understand how we would like to contribute uh, more into, uh, 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 into, into health, into climate change, global ch uh, how it's uh, affecting health and disease. So we've got a new program called Health in a Changing World. Uh, and the idea is that we will be involved in working together uh, more broadly to understand how we can contribute as, as scientists, um, uh, medical researchers uh, in different fields. And I, I want to just touch on, finally, the, the, the uh, work undertaken by a colleague, Chris Greening, uh, from uh, the Biomedicine Discovery Institute and also a member of our Monash University's uh, lead of the uh, uh, Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future. And Chris runs the One Health Microbiology Group uh, and also is a HFSP uh, grant recipient. And Chris has been working uh, at, as taking bacteria or soil samples from Antarctica and looking at uh, the different en enzymes that are present in different locations around Antarctica and found, uh, his group found that not only are there enzymes in these bacteria that are going to be taking normal organic carbon, but there are also enzymes that will uh, actually convert uh, atmospheric hydrogen and also carbon monoxide uh, and, and take those electrons out. And if you take, and so, so th there's really a huge amount of um, bacteria that actually have these enzymes that, that are actually consuming hydrogen and carbon, carbon monoxide. If we, if he, he looked at these um, uh, in, in different uh, locations uh, of Antarctica, so these are soil samples, and found that um, the hydrogen uh, gas can actually be removed from the atmosphere, actually below atmospheric levels uh, as well over time, uh, and so could carbon monoxide. Uh, so uh, these, these gases are actually important for stripping electrons out and actually feeding again into the bacterial electron transport chain that will also make ATP in a similar way. And Chris's group have, has just recently solved the structure of uh, an en uh, the, one of the enzymes, a hydrogenase, from uh, Mycobacterial smegmatis, uh, and recently published in Nature. And uh, this is the, cri the, the cryo-EM structure, so using fantastic platform technologies to de determine structures of these enzymes. And this particular hydrogenase, one that's stripping out hydrogen uh, gas uh, from, from the atmosphere, uh, is actually structurally really interesting that the hydrogen can come in here, it can enter and donate its electrons in through, uh, uh, through these iron sulfur clusters that are then taken into the enzyme, and eventually there's a, a mo mobile electron carrier that comes up through this uh, central um, uh, pipe uh, and then takes those electrons back into the membrane so it can supply that, uh, those electrons into the electron transport chain of bacteria. This is a, a fascinating enzyme because it's not like many other hydrogenases, it's not inhibited by oxygen. Uh, and oxygen actually it can't get into the, this area where the hydrogen needs to go. Uh, and notably, it's also very stable as an enzyme, as a protein, but it was purified uh, to very high temperatures, up to 80 degrees, and it can still actually work. 
And so what uh, they also found was that they even took the protein, the purified protein, and put them onto an electrode. Uh, they could actually generate a natural battery. It actually formed a current from the hydrogen in the atmosphere that drew electrons onto the, the, the surface of an of, uh, 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 electrode uh, to generate that, that current. So, so this is a really interesting area uh, of taking biology as a fundamental discovery, how bacteria in the soils uh, are actually using hydrogen normally, uh, but it's, it's changing the way we can look at the chemistry of life as well. Uh, it might also lead using these sort of types of protein machines uh, for, for different technologies. For example, uh, to sustain small air power devices is, is a potential option as an alternative source of power. It's not much current, but that current could be utilized in the future. And so that's a really exciting uh, area to go in. And so um, Chris has uh, identified uh, all the, in these bacterial systems uh, all around the world and in all different locations, in deserts, uh, in oceans, uh, in waste treatment plants. They're taking ga these trace, trace gas, uh, gases out of uh, the environment, uh, they're using them, they're sucking the electrons in, and they're using them for their biology, biological purposes as well, which is a really fascinating area uh, for, for biology as well. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening.